Good morning. It's good to, good to see everybody on this bright, sunny day. Uh, please join us in our first hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I think we have a video. My name is Ben Martin. My, I'm at Camp Edge. My favorite thing last night was petting the sheep. teaching the three and four year olds how to climb that Danny Bug made and they had a great time and we're also now going to arts with Becky Beerbeier. Having a great time. 
We just had a group of small ones, uh, probably how old Sarah? Four and five year olds. Most of them did it numerous times. They couldn't they get off one and go to the other one. Um, any input, Everett? Um, it's pretty good. They did better than I did. Um, humbled me a little bit, but. But the kids enjoyed it. <laughs> celebrate um, Camp Edge. It was an awesome experience. Uh, God says where uh, two or more are gathered in my name, I am there, and Christ was there. Um, it was wonderful to see how these kids engaged with the adults, and I was so thankful for Pat and all her hard work. Um, she wrote this, even though we've used Camp Edge name for a long time, she created and designed and curated what this our VBS was going to look like, and they concentrated on learning about creation. It was beautiful to see how the children interacted with Bruce Bilbauer, who was a wealth of knowledge about creation, and, and it, they brought it to life. Uh, and Becky with um, the crafts and the scouts, and everybody played a part from our parking lot greeters, our, um, our hospitality teams, to uh, so many. So I thank you um, because those kids are richly blessed. And those parents uh, shared with me that some of their kids didn't want to typically stay at things like this, but they ran to and begged to come each night. So that is a testimony of how God is working uh, in planting seeds. So we celebrate that today. Um, and so I want to lift that up. I am Pastor Monica, one of the pastors here. Amy is, um, they're landed or they're at least they're connected to internet because I saw Tim on. So welcome uh, to worship this morning with us. So you can pop on line on our Facebook live feed and say hello uh, to them. And so they will be back, she'll be back in the office this week. Um, we want to welcome you if you're a first time guest. We have a gift for you and I brought one up here because we want to make sure that you get one. It's a a cup. It says St. Luke's. We want you to be able to take one home with you. Uh, we want to get to know you, and we want you to hopefully find St. Luke's as a home uh, for you to come and grow with us. Our vision, a part of our vision, is helping people find and follow Jesus, and we want you to be a part of that, and we want to connect with you in that as well. And so I lift up some other good news this morning. So we held a capital campaign. Um, Back in May, we kicked that off, and we met our goal, and they've started work on our sound and technology, and the uh, Family Life Center should be done this week. So that's a praise, um, and so that's good. And then, um, yeah. So we are also, um, we had a meeting on Friday, our, um, we've, selected a contractor and the contracts are being signed and they will start Monday with um, removal of asbestos and things. So you will see that's a, that is a praise um, because I don't know that we thought it would begin this soon, but you will see caution tape and some materials for the next couple weeks. The playground will be 
closed uh, for a couple weeks just for safety. So I wanted to give you a heads up, but it's a, it's a great heads up uh, as we look to renovate that building and really pour into children in our community and in our congregation to helping them find and uh, follow Jesus as well. So just that's a heads up um, today. So I am continuing our sermon series on um, love, relationships, and marriage. And today we'll be talking about dating. Now don't everybody run away. Uh, that's a scary thought. Uh, but it's a message for all of us as we live into relationships. And so I invite you to prepare your hearts this morning as we um, get ready and go further into worship. Good morning. And now if we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Lord of all people, thank you for the beautiful week we had this week with our children. Um, thank you for the joy that they brought and the, the watching them with their open hearts and their simple ideas and just the way they viewed the world. Um, thank you for everyone that came and, and all the adults that came to be participate and to steer them and to love on them. But not only did they, did we hope the children got a lot out of the week, but all of us adults who were here were, were just blessed and enriched as well. We thank you for this week. Lord, we've had several people have surgery this week and several surgeries to come. And we just ask that you be in their hearts and be with the people that are in recovery, the people that are rehabbing, and let them know of your presence as they go through this process. We have several people in the church who are just hurting for different reasons, hurting physically and mentally. And we just ask that you just make your Holy Spirit so aware in their hearts that they know that they are okay and that they feel a sense of peace and rest in you. And open the rest of us up to what we can do to help people that are hurting. Lord, we ask that you lead us not into temptation, but that we will want to follow you and want to follow Jesus, your son that you sent to show us how to live. We are so grateful for the gift that you gave us. And we, we just ask that we will be more like Jesus every day. There is so much darkness in the world as we turn around. But as we sang this week in camp, let us be your little light. Let us be the light of hope, the light of love within our church and within Hickory and our community. And as we go out of Hickory and travel, let each one of us be the light to show love to one another, to be open to all people, to want the best out of everybody. And we ask that you open our minds and our hearts at this time so that we can truly hear the word that Pastor Monica is bringing us. And let us close in the prayer that you, that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, daily bread being done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Beth, for that beautiful prayer. Um, and as I said, we um, started this sermon series, Love, Relationships, and Marriage. And we did that because there was such a need. We found out in some demographic study that, that we received that relationships were really hard for people. But not only that, it was a top concern with folks. Folks that live within a 20-minute radius of St. Luke's. That that was part of their concern. Will I get married? Will I find someone? Um, what does it look like? And so we wanted to offer a series that would speak into that and, and help people find hope in those situations. And so as we go through this, I want to just give us a little recap of where we've been. So the first week, um, we, we kicked it off with Pastor Amy talking about from Genesis that we were created in the image of God. We were created in the, in the Imago Dei. And, um, and out of that, uh, and because of that, we are able to love because we were created out of love. And then last week, I shared the story of Ruth and Naomi and how we are called to live a love beyond ourselves as Ruth loved Naomi, a mother-in-law to her, and using the words, where you go, I will go. And there's more rich context to that, but how we need to love people in that way, where you go, I go. And so also in that example, it broke the status quo of what we are expected to do as far as a, I don't know what Siri is doing. Um, it broke the status quo of what the world expects of us and tells us to do. And Jesus came as a persistent reminder, breaking the status quo of the world in reference to our relationships. And so today we will look at what it means to live out love that breaks the status quo in our relationship with dating. Okay, so um, as we go forth, I'm reading from the Gospel of John. John chapter 15, verse 9 through 17. And you can follow along on the screen or in your Bible. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. You. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that, that he lay his life down for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father. I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit fruit that will last, then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in this message we, and in this series, I want to ground us back to Genesis. That we were not only created in the image of God, but we were created for the purpose of relationship. And we find that so well with Eve. When, when God created Eve, he said, I want to make you a companion, Adam. And, and he makes her different. And there's such joy in that, that we get to have relationship because God created us for relationship. So what does this look like as far as dating? Dating. Uh, how many of you remember your first date? 
Okay, so some hands up. So how many of you uh, think it was love at first sight? A couple of you, that's awesome. Typically, that's not it. We don't live in a Hallmark world. Would you agree? I'm a Hallmark girl. I love those movies. But it does not drive my theology around love and relationships. It is a picture or ideology that people might have, but it's not one that we learn about in Scripture. So what does that mean? What does it mean? So if we look at the culture of dating, I did some research, and I thought it was very interesting, and I want to share some things with you. I thought, how did this term come to be? Like, how did the word dating come to be? And so as I looked at this, the word dating is not used in Scripture at all. It's not used at all. Yet, relationship is found from Genesis all the way to Revelation. So if I refer to relationship, I want us to understand that relationship is um, where we start and that God does something in that. And that's where we're going to go today. But let's first look at who coined the phrase dating. Where did it first come from? The word first appeared in a newspaper article at the end of the 19th century. And it was used to mean a date on the calendar. All right, so it's a date on a calendar when you might have a specific encounter or rendezvous, as some people may have called it, or a romantic dinner, whatever. That's when it was coined. There wasn't such a thing uh, as dating even 200 years prior uh, since many marriages were arranged. You know, so parents went in to, to arrange marriages, and it was based off financial status, and um, the benefit of the whole family. So if we go back to that, that's very interesting, right? Addison, do you want to go back to that? Probably not, right? Um, and so the things uh, have changed a lot, as we can see. But in the 1900s, uh, when gentlemen became ones who initiated a relationship, a gentleman would come to a lady's house uh, for their first date, and the parents would join them. How fun is that? Right? And they would get to know each other, and then if they, like, hit it off and wanted a second one, they would hold more dates in the same fashion, coming to the girl's home and the parents being in there. All right? Has anybody ever heard those stories from their, their parents or grandparents? That's very interesting. So um, on the onset of the 20th century, women could be arrested for dating. And this was because um, things had happened. There was something that came out, and I'll share with you in a minute, but men would walk the streets with women, and they would buy them food and flowers. And this new phenomenon called the movies came out. And as women were, were, were dating men, the police didn't know what to do. It was, it was law. You didn't do that. It was kind of like... A, a faux pas, like you didn't do those things. An, interest, an interesting fact at the same time, that's when cosmetics was made. That's when that was introduced, and it was on the screen, and they wanted movie stars and things to wear. And so movie stars kind of set the pace for makeup, uh, but women typically did not wear them. And it was seen as... Um, not kosher for men to choose a woman with wearing makeup because they might have been seen as a, a little bit different, right? If you get my drift, you adults. Um, and so uh, daters at, during that period would dance. Uh, the 20s, we know the clapper movement and things. And so um, they would dance and go to amusement parks. And probably the most popular date venue was still the movie theater. Um, after World War II, it became popular to ask girls out over the phone. So that was an interesting change. And then dates often happened in public places. So it shifted from the home and out into the public places. And it was a thing among young people. Young people talked a lot about it. Um, and they 
would uh, format a date around financial needs or financial things. So it required money. So for men to take women out, uh, men were the ones that paid. Now, we definitely live in a world from that today where people go Dutch. Um, the concept of free love reached its peak in the 1970s while earlier intimacy happened on dates but was kept a secret. So um, in the 70s also this term, your biological clock, came out and so there was a need to date earlier um, so that you could um, possibly get married and have children and so that drove a little bit more of urgency among women and men. It also discouraged women from careers and, and set a different tone. That's different today as well. In the 1990s, dating brought forth this hookup culture, um, a no-strings-attached relationship which allowed men and women to be active um, participants in the dating field. Since then, that hookup culture has replaced the dating culture the years before. What was invented or what came out and was really prevalent in the 1990s do you think that would play a big part in this new culture? Anybody have a guess? Internet, cell phones, dating apps, Absolutely. All of that changed how we perceive dating. And as generations were born into that, it changed and set an expectation and a mindset around what dating looks like. Now, I'm not saying those things are wrong. I'm just telling you the facts of how things have changed. The, the Tinder app allows you to scope out a person if you're matched with them and you swipe right or left um, and based on a photo or brief information you can choose who you want to date. So um, it's no longer that uh, interaction of communication in the same ways that maybe you or I have, have participated in. This is something uh, that whether we realize it or not we are teaching generations coming up. Right? So uh, we can teach them about phones and, and apps. And again, they're not wrong. I know a lot of uh, happily married people that have, yet, have chosen and, uh, to date through an app, and, and that's wonderful. I'm just simply sharing how things have changed. But I will share that the expectation of going through different medias to find a date does set a precedent and an expectation on people that is not healthy. And so I was at a house recently, and a, and a little girl was there, a school-age girl. And, um, of course, grandparents were there, and they said, Oh, do you have a boyfriend? And I was like, they're a little young for that. You know, I'm thinking in my mind, they're a little young for that. But that's what we do. As a society, we assume and we set, that, we set that out there that they have to have that type of relationship, that they have to have some kind of a relationship with the opposite sex or another person that gives them value. As we look at what dating means to us, what is it we as followers of Christ should share about dating with our young people or those that have been divorced or those that are widowed and, and wanting companionship in that way? What is it that we need to share with one another? Well, as we look at the scripture, we find the word dating again nowhere, but yet we find the words about relationship. In fact, the New Testament says the highest calling, the preferred lifestyle of a Christian, is singleness. The preferred lifestyle is singleness. 
in which one is freely devoted to Christ and to serving Christ all of their life. Yet, John shares this beautiful image, beautiful image and message that not only disrupts the the status quo of what the world says, but gives us insight of how to move forward in all of our relationships, especially our dating relationships. So let's dig in. So when we look at these things, there's three points I want to bring out. I remember um, whenever I was growing up, my mom and I would go to date someone, my mom would say, you need to be your own person before you're somebody else's something. Have you ever heard that before? Anybody ever heard that? Well, this is, this is where I feel like this comes from. And I asked my mom, it came from her grandmother, which came down the line. But I resonated with this. And I have shared this with my own children who are now getting ready to be married. The first one in the scripture is remain in my love. Remain in my love. That means remember the love in which you were created. And hold fast to that. Remember the love in which you were created and remember that. But not only that, remember the love in which Christ died for you. That same love, that agape love that Christ died for you. Remain in that. When we know that, it's a gift. You know why? Because we know who we are as a person. We know that we were created by a God that loves us. We know that we have value and we understand that we're a gift. And that is foundational in any relationship. Because if we don't know that, then we try to find our identity in somebody else or something else. The second point in this text is love each other as I have loved you. It says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So how, how has Jesus loved us? Well, he, he came to be with us, God in human flesh. He came to be in physical relationship with us. He met with the disciples. He went out amongst the people. He showed kindness, love, humility, healing, care, compassion. And so we see that as a beautiful illustration of how we are to love. And I could go on and on and on. Jesus set the stage for love. Right? He broke the status quo. He called people out and said, no. Especially those Pharisees, which, which were the church people, which were the, the religious leaders that wanted to do something out. And Jesus said, no, this is how to love. Especially when he invited people from the street to sit at the table. This is how we are to love. The third thing, live a life of sacrificial love. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. I think about the woman that has the jar of nard, that anointing oil who came and, and gave it all to Jesus, pouring it over his head and his feet. That's sacrificial love. I think of the Good Samaritan who normally does not encounter people along the road. They were shunned, but yet the religious leader and the priest walked right by and the Good Samaritan showed sacrificial love. Sacrificing the the, the heartache and the strife between people, sacrificing what anybody else thought of them and went and loved. I think of Hagar 
if you know the story of, of, of Hagar and, um, and how she had to sacrifice her wants so that Abraham and Isaac were the first chosen. She sacrificed in that, going away and allowing God's plan to work. And sometimes that sacrificial love, allowing God to do something that we cannot. We further find sacrificial love in a list that defines love um, in 1 Corinthians. Not only are we to live um, a sacrificial love towards others, we're called to be patient. Um, I don't know about you, but patience is not one of my top uh, gifts or virtues of love, I, it's a hard struggle, um, especially in relationship. How many of you have been patient with somebody that's uh, like you're dating or married or whatever? Have, have you been patient when they're late? Or maybe they didn't call you? <laughs> patience. We're called to patience. We're also called in this text to selflessness and that's that fact uh, sacrificial love but humility putting the needs of the other person humbling ourselves always looking out for the needs of that other person now I don't do this well in, in, in our marriage sometimes my husband can tell you um, if I don't want to do something, I dig my heels, my heels in. So this is something I, even myself, I have to work on. There's a, we are a work in progress. This is not something that we will accomplish overnight, but it's something that, that Christ is calling us to remember and glean and go to as our roadmap in our relationships. So what does this have to do with dating, Monica? Well, this is the foundation of all of our relationships. This is the foundation in all of our relationships, whether it's friends, whether it's dating, whether it's marriage, whatever. This should be the foundation. And so let's take a look at what dating looks like. And, and I found this um, illustration, and, and I want to share it with you because it really shared what um, or it conveyed an image of what I wanted to share with you today hopefully you probably can't see it but I will go over it so it goes through a process relationships go through a process and so the first process is this superficial you know hi how are you um, and then we walk on right it, it's just a, a very friendly gesture we might make eye contact we might say hello um, we might even go to the next level and, and ask a question. But it's very, very minimal interaction that takes place. And last week I showed a bullseye view of a grid of relationships that went from really close relationships out. This actually works from outward in. And so we're going to give you a little bit more information about it. That next step, once we reach that superficial, hi, how are you, or maybe ask a question, the next time we have an encounter, we might um, gather a little bit more information, right? Do you remember your first date, maybe, or, or a date where you gathered some information about someone? Does anybody remember? I remember um, the first time I um, was out with my husband, he, now husband, he asked me what church I went to. I mean, he gathered information um, ab about me. So we ask people to collect that so we can get a little bit more insight into who they are inside. We want to know uh, what, where they went to school, or we might want to know what, um, who, who they're in a relationship, or who their parents are, or what their hobbies are. Um, we collect that information. And the next step is the most crucial step and where things mostly go awry, and that's vulnerability. Vulnerability. In order to love people sacrificially, we have to get vulnerable. We have to peel back the onion of our heart, and we have to say, this is who we are. But we also have to look at 
who is the other person? We have to peel back the layer and be vulnerable. The term vulnerability was originally used to describe being able to be wounded or hurt. Is that not interesting? When the city walls were strong and, and, and forfeited, there was no fear of the enemy getting through. Um, but when any part of, of a wall or protection uh, is damaged, that's when a city is vulnerable, right? We see that in, in Joshua, and we see that in, in different areas of Scripture. We're vulnerable when those walls of our heart come down. And in a relationship, vulnerability is the willingness to open ourselves up. It's that point in which we say, we're going to love this person. We make a decision, I'm going to love this person enough because I'm going to share a piece of me. I'm going to share some information about myself. And it's not just offering facts, because that's in the gathering, but it's offering those things that really mean something to you. A story. Something that brings and evokes emotion. This level is where things, you see it split to the, to the left or stay straight. This is where we decide, are we going to be vulnerable? And if we're not re- vulnerable, we move, to, we move to that left side out of fear. We move to the left side out of fear of being rejected or the thought that someone wouldn't accept the image of God, this gift of God, this person that you know is is who God has made you to be. And this causes anxiety. I don't know about you, but anxiety is at its highest. But when it comes to dating, 78% of people have anxiety around dating. And it sometimes moves into a social anxiety disorder. And so, what does that mean? What do we do? Well, on that left side, it goes down, we shut down. We no longer want to be, um, have people connect with us. Those walls come up. And then that causes even more anxiety. It causes us also to not live into what Christ has shared with us that we are supposed to live in relationship. He wants us to be in relationship. It's beautiful to be in relationship. And so what does it look like if we are accepted? What if it looks like we're vulnerable and somebody shares something with us and we share something with them? Isn't it great? Have you ever had that where you've shared a really um, heartfelt story or a part of you, <clears throat> excuse me, a part of your life and somebody received you well? Has that happened to you? I'm assuming it has because you have relationships in your life and you had to be vulnerable to get them. So when we are vulnerable and we are accepted, it is is beautiful. It is beautiful. There's self-closure. We share more in our depth and our hope and our fears um, and our desires. And our relationship moves forward. It moves on into these beautiful levels of relationship, just like I showed you last week. Some are on the peripheral, those acquaintances, and they move inward based on how vulnerable we have been and how close we have drawn into those relationships. So after we have done this self-disclosure, there is a, a known and understood. We feel known. And whether we realize it or not, there's a part of us at, in, in our being Um, As we were created to be the image of God, there is a desire to belong and be known. 
because God created us to be known. And I'm not talking about the superficial way. I'm talking about being known as his child. Being known as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Being known as a love, as an instrument of love that is personified from the inside out. That is what it means to be known and understood. And that next following step is agape love. That is when we are able to live in this agape love. These relationships where no strings are attached. That there is an unconditional love between you and that person. It's, it, it doesn't mean I love you if or I love you but. It means I love you. No strings attached. It is a love that, that goes beyond loving those who are easy to love. And moves us into a love that is within us. That it only comes from God. And was revealed to us in Christ. As we experience this kind of love, we set others up so that they may know that love. There are people among us, there are people in our community, there are people in our world that don't know that they have value, that do not know or even realize that they were created in the image of God. And in that, they are special And they have something to give. And so they make decisions based off their feelings or what people have told them or what the culture has set for them. And then we wonder why relationships don't work. Now I'm not saying every time you go into a dating relationship it's going to be the perfect fit because we all know that's not um, true. We, we, we love, we form relationships, and sometimes they go deeper, and sometimes they don't. But when we love with the love of Christ, we remain in love, have a sacrificial love, and love beyond ourselves. That is when the scripture says, my joy will be made complete. The joy of that relationship will be made complete because we have followed not only who we are, but whose we are. We've become our own person in Christ, staying connected with the source of, of life, right? It says, abide in me. We abide in Christ and we abide in Christ and we abide in Christ's love and therefore we are able to love. We're able to go deeper into those relationships of dating and we're able to connect and love in a way in which Christ's love is personified from the inside out. And so I hope that if you are single and in this stage of wanting to date someone, that you will know that you are a beautiful vessel and that you can move forward in that. And that you don't have to waver on who you are to be formed in somebody else's expectations or image. And if you are in a marriage, same goes for you. Just because you are married and you have a commitment with one another and you've coveted to do life together, the same is true. That love continues throughout your relationship as well. It continues throughout your relationship as well. 
And for those of you that are, are not ready to date and things, love Christ well. Because he calls us to live a life devoted to serving him, loving others always. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, we thank you for a message of hope. That we don't have to be anything other than who you have created us to be. And who you are grooming us to be through your word. We're reminded, oh God, that we are not able to love or give of ourself until we come to know who we are and whose we are. So God, as we go forth, I pray that each of us claim the good news that we are a child of God and that you instill in us the love of Christ. And through Jesus Christ, you gave us a way to love each other the way you have loved us. Be with those, Lord, who struggle with anxiety around dating and relationships. Lord, instill in them your love. And may they know that they are not alone. That you are always with us and you call us to abide in you. We thank you, O oh God, for this good news today. Amen. I invite our ushers forward for the giving of our tithes and offerings. speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love and have not love though I'm blessed with the special gift of prophecy and have not love and have not love though my faith be strong enough to move a mountain though I bestow my worldly goods to feed the If I have not lived with love, I am nothing but a sounding brass, a tinkling cymbal. Nothing, nothing. But with love I can bear it all, rejoicing, because of love because of love for love suffers everything love beareth everything love hopeth everything love believeth everything there abide at three things faith hope and love but the greatest of these
as we close the service uh, today and before the praise team uh, sings, I want to give you this blessing. Go forth in the name of Jesus Christ, knowing that you are loved. And then go out in the world and share this good news so that others may find hope, the hope and love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. Yes, you did. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. When I was your foe, still your love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no one, you paid it all for me. Yes, you did. You have been so, so kind to me. Sing with us. Oh, the overwhelming. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. With us. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no wall. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99. I 
couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Give yourself away. All the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Reckless love.